session. So you're most welcome. And I would like to take the honor to introduce our presenter for today. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, our presenter today is Miss, I mean, is Madame Oliotoyen Sudope. Oliotoyen is a people development professional, career coach and author with competences and experience in business advisory, learning and organizational development and human resource journalist functions, cutting across various sections in the human resources. She holds a bachelor's degree in psychology from Abafemi Awolowo University and a master's degree in industrial and labor relations with a specialization in human resource management from the University of Lagos, both in Nigeria. She is an associate of the Chartered Institute of Personal, Personnel Management of Nigeria and a member of Human Resource Business Professional Network, United States of America, and also is a licensed human resource practitioner. Our presenter today, Ms. Madame Oliotoyen leads a, leads a learning academy that trains coaches, mentors, uh, recent graduates and young professionals as they are uh, they equipped with the 21st century skills to thrive and excel in the workplace. She is a regular facilitator at a global organization and passionate about the people dynamics, personal and social transformation through self-leadership, innovation, and effective policy formulation. She currently serves as a chief executive officer at Sesiwa, Nigeria's first inter internship focus and foremost career development organization, where she provides strategic direction and implementation with a team of young, passionate people who are committed to solving Africans' unemployment and education challenges that are alarming our continent today. With me, I want to welcome you and hand over the floor to our presenter this beautiful day, Madame Ole Twain. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bonnie. Uh, it's a big pleasure to be here. And thank you to Wells Mountain Initiative for the opportunity. This is the third year I'm facilitating this session. And it just really shows, you know, the love that they have for me. Uh, so I don't take it for granted. I thank you, um, Nicole. I know she's listening to me somewhere. Um, thank you for always trusting me, you know, and always bringing me back um, to this um, to this sessions. I'm really excited to be here. So I also want to say a very warm welcome to everyone that I see on this call. Um, I wish I could run through all your names. I see Akin, I see Charles, Cindy, um, Fode, Gabriel, Gilbert, Johnson, Larry, Leponesa, Lovett, Miriam, Mayom, um, Nepoyak, I hope I'm pronouncing your names well, but I really want to pronounce them, okay? I see Nasilele, Patrick, Philip, Putan, Roland, Tio, um, a very, very warm welcome to you all. Um, I see that you're also joining from, you know, from different parts. Um, thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me. It's my absolute pleasure to be with you. So as we start, I'm going to be sharing my screen um, in a couple of minutes from now, but I want you to give to me in the chat section how you're feeling today. How are you feeling? If you were to describe your feeling in one word, how would you be feeling today? Let, let me know. Let me know. I'm feeling excited because I always love, you know, being here with you guys, you know, at the session. So tell me in the chat sections, how are you feeling? Okay, Miriam is feeling happy. I love it. Charles motivated. Oh, amazing, amazing. Okay, okay. Okay, Fred is excited. Nice. Tio is also excited. Fode is definitely feeling motivated. I'm loving it. Miriam is also feeling inspired. Okay, okay. I like the sound of that, okay? 
Okay, Akim is tired with work and the heat of the summer. Oh, I'm so sorry about that, but you're happy to be here. That's the good news. Well done. Gilbert is inspired and prepared to learn. I love it. I love that you're open-minded and you're really ready to learn. Putin is really motivated. Amazing. Gabriel says, I'm pronouncing names well with a beautiful Nigerian accent. Oh, gosh. I should frame that comment. It means so much to me. Thank you, Gabriel. Leponessa is excited. Patrick is very happy and eager to learn. Napoyak is replenished by my Uma. Okay, so maybe I should do this humor more since you're replenished by it. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you. Thank you all for sharing how you're feeling with me. Nice, nice, nice. So let me share my screen um, and let's get right into it. Okay. Okay, so welcome, welcome, welcome um, to this training session today. Um, a brief introduction about myself. My name is Olua Tony Shodikwe. I'm a people development partner, uh, practicing HR for about eight years. I'm also a career coach and a, an author as well. I've just authored a book. Um, I'm also the chief executive officer at Shishewa, and Shishewa is Nigeria's first internship focused and foremost career development organization. Um, for over 10 years, we have equipped over 10,000 youths with work, um, workplace readiness programs, um, internship placements, job shadowing, volunteering. Um, we have really gotten our hands on um, with solving Africa's employment, unemployment and educational challenges. Um, so it's really um, a great work that we do at Shishewa, solving these challenges one at a time. We're committed to two of the SDGs in particular, which is SDG 4, which is to, um, um, to promote, um, to provide education, quality education, and also SDG 8, which is to promote decent work and economic growth. And we're really thankful, you know, for our partners and everyone who has helped us in achieving um, that result. Okay. So let's go straight into it. Remember, this is going to be, we're going to make this as interactive as possible. So if you have questions, I'm sure that Bonnie is going to be helping me take note of them so we can ask our questions at the end of this session. I want to see your comments in the chat session. I want it to be as engaging as much as we can have it, okay? So today, the first part of this session, we're going to be looking at... Um, human resources. What is the importance of human resources to the workforce? Uh, we're going to be looking at how we can determine our startup needs. So for some of us who have just um, created a company, you have a young startup that you are leading, we're going to be looking at how you can do some staffing, um, how many people you are going to need, how many people should you be um, hiring at this early stage of your business. We're also going to look at some of the staff needs um, versus the budgetary constraints. We understand that for some startups, uh, you might have little or no capital. So we're going to look at how you can still get the people that you need with as little money you know, that you can get. We're going to look at different types of team members and what you can offer these team members, right? Benefits that you can provide to them. And we would look at how you can hire, okay, um, both for paid and unpaid positions, how you can come up with a structure for your human resource um, function, okay? Before we go into that, let's take a quick activity. So tell me in the chat section, if you had superpowers and you could have or change just one thing, what would it be? Let me see in the chat section. So imagine that you had this superpower or you had superpowers, what would you change or what would you be? Let me see if you had superpowers. What would you like to change, whether in your environment, in your society, or personally, what would a superpower be and what would you like to change? So I'm waiting to read in the chat section. Waiting, waiting, waiting. What superpowers would you have? Would you want to have? And if you could do anything with it, what would be the first thing that you would do? Okay, Mayam is like putting the right people in the right place. I love it. I love it. I love it. Okay, 
that's that's a good use of your superpower trust me okay let's have it coming i'm waiting guys waiting to read from you if you had superpowers what would you change i believe that there are a lot of things that we want to change there are a lot of things that we wish we could do or we wish we had if only you know we could just have some sort of power so tell me tell me in the chat section Miriam saves time traveling. Mm, that's a really smart one. So time travel, would it be, tell me, would it be going to the past or going to the future? Which would you want to do more? Miriam, tell me in the chat section. Which would you want to do more? Is it going to the past or going into the future? Okay, Bonnie says have pen and, okay, okay. Bonnie is telling us to have our pen and notebook ready to take tips of course you should be doing that okay so i'm waiting i want to read from more people i want to read from more people i want to read from more people okay jean says if i had a superpower i would go to see what's in the future to inform people get prepared before and look at that using your superpower for good i love it you would want to go into the future to prepare people for what is at and absolutely amazing Napeo says, making the world a better place for everyone. Oh gosh, I am so inspired. I love that you really want to use your superpowers for something great. This is inspiring to see. Okay. Mayam says, leading people into action. Miriam says, would love to go to the future and see what is happening and make preparations against climate change and the pandemic. This is phenomenal. Tio says, superpower to heal the people from the pain emotional, physical, or mental, so that we can move forward together. Till you've, you've said it all. This is what, you know, we should use our superpowers for. We can heal ourselves and move forward together. Absolutely amazing. Fode says, I would love to end poverty by promoting financial inclusion within and beyond my communities in Sierra Leone and beyond Africa. At this, of course, I mean, I'm in the midst of scholars. What was I expecting? You all are using your superpowers to make the change that you want to see. And this is truly phenomenal. This tells me I am in the midst of the right people. That I'm not seeing anybody saying they want to use their superpowers to oppress people. It's the fact that you want to use your superpowers to do good. I think this is just the highlight of this session. Okay, fantastic. If you want to keep writing for me, keep putting in the chat section and I will come back to read them. All right, let's go straight into what we have for today because of our time. Okay, now let's take a bit of introduction, right? What is human resources? I know that you've probably heard the word human resources you know, somewhere, somewhere, maybe you've read it in a book or you've had someone who had a business talk about it, you know, so you probably heard the word human resources. It would be one of the most common word, but as a, um, as a startup founder, as someone who has um, a business or whether you have an NGO, what is human resources and why is it important for every organization? Why is it important for you to know and for you to put in place in your organization. So I've said here that human resource is the supply of people for the execution of a particular task or project. So you probably heard before, you know, human resource is not just a department, right? Of course, the human resource department can exist, but beyond the department, human resource deals with a supply of people for the execution of a particular task or project, right? And what human resource management is, is the proper utilization of the people that we have gotten. So human resource management is the proper utilization of the people that have been supplied of the available skilled workforce so that we can achieve our goals and objectives. So in summary, the simple English is when you hear the word human resource management, it simply means the process by which we're utilizing the employees or the available workforce that we have in order to achieve our organizational goals and objectives. And in human resources, there are different activities that make up the word human resources. So in human resources, you can have uh, different processes like recruiting, um, selecting, training, compensating, 
performance management, monitoring, anything in the organization that has to do with handling people, managing people is saddled um, uh, on the human resource department. Do you see what I'm saying? Okay. So now we're having an understanding of what human resource is. Now, what are some of the things, you know, that constitutes human resource management? Now you hear me say HRM a lot. I'm simply talking about human resource management. Okay. So in human resource management, right, or in HRM, you have activities such as recruitment and recruitment is the process of hiring. Okay. So when you want to apply for a job, or when you're sending your CV, you are taking part in the recruitment process. To recruit means to attract or to, um, to get an employee or a skilled, a, a skilled worker, okay? So you have recruitment, you have selection, you have training, you have assessing performance, um, you have motivating your employees, anything. And this is what I want you to remember. Anything that you do in the organization that you do for the people that work in that organization is human resource management. Let me know if you understand it in the chat section. Let me see. Let me see if you understand it in the chat section. I want to be sure that we're following. Let me see. You can just say yes, 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 or if you don't understand. Okay, Miriam, clearly, fantastic. Okay, so anything that you do in the organization that is related to the people is human resource management. And there are different things that you can do for the people in the organization. So the first thing we have here is recruitment and onboarding. This is usually the first stage of bringing in employees into the organization. Recruitment is the point where you put out a vacancy, um, you put out a job description, or you put out a job profile. The process of attracting right, and hiring a, a, a potential employee is what we call recruitment. Now, onboarding is the next stage of recruitment, and onboarding has to do with where you are exposing them to the systems, the policies, the procedures of the organization. Basically, it is at this point that you start to initiate them into the culture of the organization. So usually, the onboarding process would go, uh, would go like you, talking to the potential employees about how we do our work here, um, who is the boss, who, um, who are your subordinates, who are your colleagues, our policies, our procedures, what you need to know, what you don't need to know, and all of those things. That is where the recruitment and onboarding comes. Now, compensation and rewards is also a part of HRM, and this is the part that deals with salary payment. So let me use as simple as that. When you're paying salaries or you are rewarding people for doing good job or for going above and beyond, it comes under compensation. Rewards and recognition is also, um, for example, if an employee has performed so well in this quarter and you name them the employee of the month, that falls under compensation and reward. So it's the process by which we reward or compensate uh, our employees for the work that they do or for the work that they have done. Another part of human resource is conflict management or human resource management is what we call conflict management. So in the organization, the process by which two people or two departments will usually get into loggerheads and try to solve it is what we call conflict management. Now, conflict is an inevitable, um, it's an inevitable action in the organization. Because we come from different backgrounds, we must also understand that there will always be conflict. It's inevitable. It's hard to avoid conflict. And so the responsibility of HRM is to ensure that conflict is being managed. Conflict is being resolved. It cannot be avoided, but it can be managed. Okay? So we have conflict management. We also have learning and development. Learning and development is the part of HRM that trains the employees. So the process whereby employees go on training or you are training your employees, what I'm doing today, this is a part of learning and development. I am sharing knowledge with you. I am sharing information with you. This is a part of learning and development. Another part of HRM is performance management. This simply is the process by which an employee's performance is assessed over a period of time. 
So if you hire an employee this month, at the end of one month, you can have something we call a performance appraisal, which is the process by which you are assessing how the employee has performed from the, uh, from the time they joined the company to this present moment. We also have something that we call KPIs. KPI means key performance indicators. And what this means is these are the criteria or these are the goals that the employee should fulfill within the space of time. Okay, so every employee in the organization has a KPI. They have key performance indicators. They have criteria and standards by which they would operate and will be assessed on. So that is what we call performance management. And we also have a critical part of HRM, which is health and safety. Because we don't want, we just don't want employees to come into the organization and work. We want to ensure that they are healthy, they feel safe, they feel loved, they feel like they are part of a working team. And that's where health and safety comes into place. So all the parts that you see on the screen are activities that the human resource um, department or the human resource personnel will usually take part in for the benefit of the employees. Remember, the people of the organization are the center of human resource management activities. Without people, there is no organization. And this is why HRM is very important. Now, for some of you, you might I not have such a structured organization yet to have a human resource department. And that's why I like to say HRM is not a department, right? It's not a department, you know, with people sitting in a box office. No, HRM is a process, is a process of utilizing, managing, and getting the best out of our people, okay? Now, let's move on very quickly. Now, what is the importance of HRM? So someone is asking, human resource, why do I need to know it? Why do I need to learn anything about it? Why should I be involved? Every organization that exists must have this process of human resource management. The people make up the organization, and I know we've heard that before, that the people make up the organization. Without the people, there is no organization. The people make up the organization. And as long as you have people in your organization, then human resource management is vital to the success of both the people and the organization at large. Now, what is the importance or what are the importance, right, of HRM? The first thing is to maintain quality of work life. Relationship between working condition um, with management. Now, the human resource professional, the human resource personnel has the responsibility of ensuring that the people who are working in the organization are well taken care of. They have a cordial working relationship. They basically balance the relationship between the management and the employees. You know, sometimes we need a middleman in having certain conversations and going through certain phases. The HR department or the HR personnel is the one that maintains and bridges the gap between the employees and the senior management. It's also important for us to understand HRM because if we understand how our people perform, if we understand what they need to perform, we'll be able to increase productivity and profit. Without the people in the organization, there's no productivity. And if our people are not well taken care of, if they are not happy, there's no productivity. And if there's no productivity, there's no profit. Do you see why we need people? Do you see why we need to take care um, of employees in the organization? Another importance is to produce employees who are easily adaptable to change. So in the context of human resource uh, personnel, what the human resource personnel does is to ensure that every employee in the company loves working in the company, and they are able to adapt to change. In our organizations, we would always have changes. Change is the one constant thing. It's the permanent thing. So the question is, when those changes come, how do we get our employees to adapt to those changes? Let me give you an example. When COVID happened during the pandemic, in which I know that you know, some countries you know, are still trying to adjust, some of the organizations that transitioned into fully remote work were able to sustain themselves and their employees 
because of the presence of the human resource um, professional or the human resource personnel. Because it is the human resource person who engages in activities that would ensure that the employees are doing well, even though they are working from home, they are not, not uh, they are not worn out, they are not tired, they are adapting to the changes that have come. And that's the importance of HRM. Another thing that um, is important to know is it helps us to match demand and supply of human resources. So without the HR department, we start to ask ourselves question, how do we know the people that we need, right? How do we know the people that we need to achieve our goals? The HRM is also responsible for retaining employees and motivating them to accomplish company's goals. Let me tell you something. Some of us are founders. We founded a company or we are CEOs of company or we are directors of organizations. It is not every director of an organization that can manage the employees of the organization. We all have our strengths. We all have our weaknesses. And one of the strengths of the human resource personnel is that they have the strategy and the insight to retain employees and motivate them to achieve the company's goals, right? Do you see that? Another thing that HRM does for us is to recognize merits and contribution of employee. So, you know, when we were talking about some of the activities of HRM, we mentioned compensation and reward. So it is the HR personnel who recognizes who needs to be rewarded, who needs to be appreciated. And one thing you must also understand is if you don't appreciate your employees, then they are not encouraged to do better. And so as directors, as CEOs, as HR personnel, you must learn to recognize and reward the people that work for you. It is beyond paying them a salary. And especially for some of you who might not be able to uh, pay some people's salary, you will need to appreciate them. And as we go, we're going to look at the different ways you can reward people aside from monetary terms or financial means, okay? The HRM also helps to create a feeling of belongingness and team spirit in employees. The director or the CEO is thinking, I need to make profit. I need to make income. What the HR person does is to ensure that everyone in the company has a sense of belongingness and their team spirit in the midst of all the employees. The HRM is also involved in the resolution and management of, conf of conflict. We talked about this earlier when we started to talk about conflict management, that the HR personnel uh, or the HR activity of conflict resolution and conflict management is one of the most important activities that must exist in the organization because conflict is inevitable. We will always have conflicts. And so we must have um, a system in place to ensure that we're managing and resolving conflict. The final thing I will talk about here is the HRM also helps to develop corporate image. The reason why some people have joined organization is solely because the HR structure and the HR process is so attractive, is so fascinating. Right from when you go for an interview, depending on how the HR manager spoke to you, how they represented the company, it would tell you it is a company you want to join because usually the HR manager is the first point of contact in the organization when you want to join an organization. And so these are some of the importance of human resource activity, uh, human resource management. One thing I want you to remember and take away is that if you have an organization, it means that you have people. And if you have people for you to get the best out of your employees, you need to ensure that every part of the human resource activity is constantly being deployed in terms of performance management, in terms of conflict management, in terms of um, health and safety, that your employees are well taken care of, that they are being utilized, right? Okay, let's move very quickly. I really love this quote by Steve Wine. It says, human resource isn't the thing that we do. It is the thing that runs our business. Do you see that? Such a fascinating quote. That human resource isn't something that we do. It is the fuel that runs our business. As long as you have people in your organization, then you must incorporate human resource activities. Jim Collins also says that great vision without great people is irrelevant. 
you can't possibly run your company all by yourself. Is it that you need clients or you need partners or you need employers or you need funders or you need employees? You can't. You can't run your business by yourself. Whether you are in the NGO space, uh, you are in the CPO space, you can't run your business or your organization by yourself. And so this is that great vision without great people is irrelevant. And what human resource activities helps you to do uh, or helps you to achieve is to find great people that can help you achieve your great vision. All right. Now, let's go a bit deeper. Let's start to look at how we can determine our staffing needs. I understand that for some of you on this call, you are just starting up a business, you are just starting up an organization or an institution, and maybe you don't have a lot of money, maybe you haven't raised some capital, and you need um, to hire some people. How do you determine your staffing needs? Now, as a startup founder, it is important to know that not every position will be needed in your first few years. And you must really understand this, that at the beginning of your organization or at the start of your business, it is not every position that you need to fill. It is not every position that you would need in the first few years. So we always advise you, if you're starting out on your organization, to start lean. And what a lean workforce means is that from the word lean, it means that we have just enough or just the right amount of people that are priority to the business as of now. Let me give you an example. For example, if you have, if you are a, you've just started um, an NGO, a non-governmental organization or a not-for-profit organization, um, and as the director, you might not need to hire uh, maybe an accountant or a finance officer as of now. You may want to outsource it, or if you have maybe a colleague who has that experience, they might want to do that for you. But you can have 10, 12, 20 people on your payroll at the start of your business. It might not be necessary because remember, you need to pay them. So if you have not started to make enough profit that can sustain your staff, then you should not be hiring such a large workforce. Okay, now what are some of the things that you should consider when you want to staff um, your startup, when you want to hire people as a young company, as a startup, what are some of the things you should consider? The first thing you need to do is to define your immediate business needs. And how do you do that? You want to highlight critical areas of your business that are directly generating revenue. I'll give you an example. In my organization, one of the core activities that we engage in is in recruitment of talent, internship, intern placement. And so one of the key personnel to my business is a recruiter. So I need, or I must have a recruiter, which I have. So a recruiter is more important to my business right now than, let me see, what example can I use? Um, 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 maybe, I'm trying to think of an example I can use. A recruiter is more important to my business than maybe a social media manager. I could say that. Because a recruiter needs to be skilled in hiring for my clients than a social media manager. So you must understand your immediate business needs. What are the things that you want to achieve, you know, in the next two months, three months? And this is how you determine the people that can help you achieve that and generate revenue. If you've generated enough revenue, you can then start to hire more positions. The second thing you need to do is to create your compensation plan and check for sustainability. What does this simply mean? Is that at the start of your business or your organization or your startup, look at it. How much can you afford to let go of in terms of salary? If you've received funding or investment, you might have a lot of money. But even at that, remember that you need to give account of how you're spending the money. But if you have not received funding and you have just started up a business, you must check your compensation plan and check for sustainability. And what this means is that, are you able to pay the salaries of the people you are hiring for the next six months if you don't make a profit? 
That's a question you want to ask yourself. Do you have enough money or the way you have structured your business? Can you pay your employees for the next six months without owing them salaries? That's sustainability. You can't pay them first month and not pay them second month. So you must ensure that you have a plan in place that can pay them for the next six months, even if you don't make profit. The third thing to do is to outsource your service functions to reduce administrative cost, right? So for example, you might not need to hire a payroll officer if you can outsource your payroll management. There are companies who are specialists in managing your payroll. Marketing, I don't have a marketer because as of now, it's not very vital to my business. I have someone who handles my social media, who handles um, the companies who handles our social media, but marketing might not be an immediate business need for me, okay? So you want to identify what are the things that are critical to your business at this stage. The next thing you need to do is to create a clear job description for the roles you want to hire. Any role that you cannot clearly explain what they will be doing and how they will be contributing to the income of the company is not a role you should be hiring for the first six months to one year. Let me know if you understand me in the chat section that any role that you cannot clearly explain what they will be doing is not a role you should be hiring for the next six months to one year. Let me know if you understand it in the chat section. Do you understand what I've just said? Exactly, absolutely understood. Thank you, Napayok, right? If you cannot determine what they will be doing, how they will be bringing in money, how they will be contributing to the income, then you should not be hiring them yet. Now, the final thing is to consider culture fit. One of the most important things that you can do for your business or your organization at the beginning is to ensure that you are hiring people who are not just competent, but who are also a culture fit. And what is culture fit? What is culture? Culture is the way of life. Culture is how we do our things here. Culture is how what we are known for, how we carry out our processes, how we carry out our work. There are some organizations that are quite flexible. The power dynamics and the power structure is bare, very minimum, right? It's a culture of everybody has a say here. Everybody has an entitlement, uh, um, is entitled to their opinion. So when you're hiring beyond the competence, you must also hire for the culture. You cannot hire someone that does not believe in the mission you are trying to achieve. Do you understand that? That when you're communicating your mission and your vision or your idea or the solution, to the problem that you have identified. You should not be hiring someone who doesn't believe in your mission. And that's why even if someone is talented, they are very competent, they are very gifted. The question is beyond their talent and their giftedness, do they believe in what we are trying to achieve here? Do they believe in what we're trying to solve here? I'll give you an example. In Sheshawa, some of the people that we have or almost all the people that we have, are people who have a passion to solve the education and unemployment challenges in Africa. You must have people that believe in the vision. You must have people that believe in the mission. So if people don't believe in your mission, if they don't believe in your vision, then they are not the people you should be hiring. At the start of your business, you need to consider culture fit. Let's move very quickly. now. As a young startup um, founder, you're just starting a business, you're just starting an organization, what are the different types of team members that you might have or that you might come across? You have four types of team members. You have paid um, team members, you have unpaid team members, you have interns, and you have volunteers. Now, who is the paid team member? This is a team member who receives regular monetary um, rewards for their service. So at the end of the month, the people you pay at the end of the month for their service in that month, they are paid team members. Now, the paid team members are the people who don't receive financial rewards for their services, but maybe you compensate them in other ways. Maybe um, you give them free lunch, you give them gift vouchers, but they are unpaid team members. 
That is, they don't receive any financial reward for their service. Then you have interns, which is one of the things that you know we specialize in um, at Sheshawa. Interns are team members who are in the organization to gain meaningful and practical work experience, right? They could either be unpaid or they could be paid interns. So interns are usually young graduates or undergraduates who are coming to gain meaningful and practical work experience. They come to learn and they could also earn at the same time, but they are at the entry level, okay? Volunteers are people who have indicated willingly to contribute their skills and their expertise without expecting any financial reward. So you have the paid team members. You pay them at the end of the month or at the end of the week. You have unpaid team members who you don't pay in terms of monetary value, but you give them things like free lunch, gift vouchers. You have interns who as much as maybe they've come to earn, most importantly, they've come to learn workplace readiness, right? And you have volunteers. These are people who willingly um, contribute their skills or their expertise without expecting any financial reward. You can have paid um, volunteers, but it would be at the discretion, it, it will be at the discretion of the employer because volunteering um, is usually done for free. You are willingly contributing your skills and your talent. So these are the four types of team members um, that we would look at. Now, I want us to discuss briefly in the chat section, what are some possible positions, right, that a community-based organization will need in its first year? Maybe you're on this call, you have a not-for-profit, you have a non-governmental organization. What are some positions that you think or that you might have had in the first year of your operation? I want to read in the chat section. Okay, Patrick says operations manager. Okay, Miriam says volunteers. Yes, 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 yes. Operations manager. Miriam also says interns. Right, right, right. So you need volunteers in the first phase of your business as a community based organization. You need volunteers because if it's community based, then it means that you need a lot of people. You need people who are willing to contribute their skill, their expertise, their time without expecting any financial reward, okay? And you also need operations, right? I think this is an important one. So in the first year of your business, you might have an idea, does not mean you are an excellent operations person. It doesn't mean you are a great operations manager. So you need operations manager, someone who will help you to put the operations, you know, of the business in place, okay? Interns, Anatoly says financial manager. Okay, okay, interesting. Volunteers, volunteers. Tio says community members. This is absolutely correct. You need community members who are willing, you know, to contribute to your cause, whether physically or mentally or financially. Anyhow, you know, they are willing to contribute to you. Fode says, I, I, I already have volunteers at this stage. Absolutely, you are very, you are very on point. So these are some of the positions that you need um, in your first year. So of course, you as the founder or the co-founder or the executive director, uh, maybe a general secretary or an admin manager who can also be a project manager or an operations manager. For a CBO, you might also need a communications manager, right, or a PR manager or a social media manager, someone who helps to put out your course or your mission into the society, either by um, electronic means, either by physical means, someone who serves as the liaison between the organization and the community, the people you are trying to help. You also need a volunteers coordinator. If you have volunteers, then you probably need someone who would lead the volunteers or who would coordinate um, the volunteers. So these are some positions that you might need at the beginning um, of your, at the startup phase of your business or your organization. Now, what are some of the things that you can provide? So I understand that at the beginning of your startup, at the early phase, you might not have enough financial resources to pay, to pay um, your volunteers 
or your employees or the people who are working with you. So what are some of the things that you can provide for your volunteers? You can have health insurance, for example, if you are maybe a large organization and you can afford it, you can have health insurance. You can have gift vouchers for them. So maybe you give them a gift voucher of some amount that they can use to buy stuff, personal stuff for themselves. You can give them free lunch. You are not giving them money directly, but you are giving them other things, you know, that would replace money. So you have free lunch. You can also do a sponsor training, right? You see, um, you can also give them flexibility. So you can say, um, okay, you can work three times a week as opposed to five times a week. That's also something that you can give your unpaid team members. You can also give them mentorship, right? Helping them, grooming them, right? Coaching them. This is also a way to reward your unpaid team members. You can see that none of these things has to do with hands exchanging money, but it's a way to appreciate them, a way to reward them for the work that they're doing um, with your organization. Okay, now, what are the different strategies for recruiting for paid and unpaid positions? So you are a startup founder, you want to recruit and you need people in paid positions and there are positions that you cannot afford to pay them now, but you need people there. Now in paid positions to recruit, you usually do an open vacancy, right? So that people are going to see your vacancy, they are going to apply. So you're gonna do open vacancy. But if you're recruiting for an unpaid position, maybe volunteering, you will need referrals and networks. So for some of you, maybe you belong to associations, you belong to already existing networks in your countries, in your communities, then that is a good place for you to find people that are willing to contribute their expertise without you having to pay them. For paid positions, you have to clearly state job requirements and other compensation package, okay? When you're trying to recruit for paid positions, you must clearly state what they will be doing and how much you'll be paying them. For unpaid positions, you must, as much as possible, avoid ambiguous job requirements. Because remember, you are not paying them. So you can say to an extent that they might be doing you a favor. They are contributing their expertise, their skill. So you need to take away ambiguity as much as possible and also let them know at the point of recruiting them, the non-monetary benefits they will be getting. So for example, you can say, um, of course, we're not going to be paying you, but we're going to be giving you free lunch, maybe twice a week, or we're going to be having one hour coaching session, maybe once a month. These are examples of non-monetary benefits. For paid positions, you advertise the vacancy from a problem-oriented angle. And what does this mean? So if you're recruiting for a paid position, you are looking for someone who will bring a solution to the problem that you have. That's for a paid position. You already have a problem or a challenge as an organization. You are hiring someone who would bring a solution and you are paying them for that solution or for that idea that they are bringing. But in unpaid positions, you advertise from a solution-oriented angle. And what this means is that you already have the solution. You just need people who can work with you to execute the solution or implement the solution. I hope you get a difference. In the paid position, you are coming from a problem-oriented angle. As an organization, if I have a problem, I'm recruiting someone who can offer me a solution and I'm paying them. But if you are a CBO or an NGO, you are recruiting people to join you in implementing the solution that you already have. That's the difference. And I hope you understand that. In paid positions, you would focus on both the culture fit and the competence. Culture fit, we already talked about it, the way we do our things, our mission, the cost that we believe in. And competence is what are your abilities, right? Competence is the combination of your skills, your knowledge, and your abilities or your attitude, like we say. Okay, so you focus on both culture fit and competence. In unpaid positions, it is important for you to prioritize culture fit over competence. Let me tell you what, if you're recruiting for paid positions, right, you need the person to know how to do the work because you can't be paying someone every month 
if they don't know how to do the job, it will be a waste of money. But in the unpaid positions, more than someone who can do the job, you need someone who believes in what you are doing as a company. You need someone who believes in your mission, your vision, your objectives. Someone who shares the same passion as you when you're recruiting for unpaid positions. Okay? And I hope we really understand that. Now, I want us to quickly discuss, and I want you to give it to me in the chat section as quickly as possible. Our time is fast spent as we start to wrap this up. What are some critical positions that a financially bootstrapped startup business would need? So for example, you don't have so much money, you've not raised capital, um, you've not really found investment. What are some critical positions that your startup business would need? So this is not a CBO now, this is a business. Like you are in need for the profit. What are some critical positions that you think that you would need um, in the first phase of your business? Let me, let me hear you um, in the chat section. Okay, we are wrapping this up. What are some positions um, that we can have? Okay. I would want to read um, from you in the chat section, but let me quickly move on because of our time. So an example of positions like this would be HR admin manager. You can see HR coming up again is as important as anything. You need the human resource manager or the administration manager, okay? You also might need a digital marketer or a social media manager who would help to put out what you are doing right, so that people can see and patronize you. You might also need a web developer, if you see what I mean, because if you are trying to create a solution, you have a problem and you're trying to create a solution, you might need a web developer, right, who would help you to find um, your solutions. Egide says a marketing manager, and actually also says a marketing manager, absolutely. Whether a digital marketer, or a marketing manager, you need someone who would help to advertise and put out your business so that you can get clients. All right. In conclusion, as we try to wrap this up, I want you to understand that the presence or absence of HR activities can drastically improve or negatively affect the organization. The presence of the HR person or the HR personnel or HR activities in your organization can tell how well your employees will grow. It can tell how well your employees will be utilized to achieve the goals of the company. And so one major objective for HRM is for us to drive productivity by ensuring that every employee that we hire and retain are competent, okay? And so it's very important whether you are operating as a CBO or you are operating um, as a startup, HR activities are important. As long as you are working with people in your organization, as long as you have employees, you must engage in human resource activities, okay? All right, I think we have come to the end of this training session and I would pass it over to Bunny at this point. Wow. Wow, wow. Thank you very much for that quite inspiring um, presentation. And I would like to put this into perspective. We have quite a number of questions because, but because of time, we will be picking a few questions for you to take a, a shot on. I have quite a number of questions coming in. Let me begin with um, the very first question we have received here. Uh, Jem says uh, it is compelling to recruit board members, board members for startup CBOs. What is the consequences for running CBO without a board? I'd like us to check one question at a time. Okay, really, really brilliant question. Um, the question is: Is it compulsory to recruit board members for your startup CBO? Um, the truth is, at the start of um, at the start of your CB, you might not be able to afford recruiting board members, but it is very necessary to have board members at the start of your CBU because what your board members do is they keep you in check. Remember that you are a not-for-profit organization, 
and you are going to be getting funding, you're going to be getting investment. What your board members do for you is they keep you within the boundaries of your mission or your course. Another reason why it's important for you to have board members is in the process of bidding for grants and for investment, a lot of investment company and grant organizations want to see that you have a governing body. They want to trust you. When you have a board, um, when you have board of directors, investors and funders trust you more. I think I'll just give it a last simple answer. So if you can, I will advise you to have um, board members. Board members that you might not be able to pay and your board members will understand that it is CPO, they might not earn a salary. And that's why you need to find people who are invested in your mission. People who have the same passion um, with you in solving that particular problem. So it's advisable to have a board if you can do that. Well, there's another question coming in from Gilbert. Gilbert says, what should I do to, to a volunteer whose performance is not up to the task despite his willingness and my training trainings offers offered? Wow, that is a brilliant, I'm loving the questions. They're really brilliant questions because these are real life scenarios, especially if you are not paying the person and they are not performing up to task. Um, I think first of all, what I would say is have a conversation with them, right? Have a conversation with them, ask them, is there, are there challenges that they are facing in executing this particular task? Um, would they want to transition into another department? Because if you have a volunteer who is very good at project management, but you put them in community engagement, there's already a disparity in their abilities. So you want to make sure that you are mapping them accurately with the tasks that they are gifted in. So someone who likes to, maybe an extrovert, who likes to speak, who likes to talk, you can't make that person an operations manager. You rather make the person a community manager or a volunteers coordinator. Okay, so the first thing is to have a conversation. Okay, why is your performance low? Are there things, you know, um, are there challenges that you are experiencing? Are there other areas in this organization that you think that you can do better at and you know you must approach it with all patience because they're volunteers um, but sometimes as long as they are not impacting on your output um, you can find someone maybe another volunteer to do what you want them to do um, but at the end of the day if a volunteer is not performing they would literally exit themselves but make sure you're having a conversation with them wow thank you we had quite a number of questions, but because of time, I would like to give you uh, just 30, 30 seconds to give your final shot to our attendees this in this webinar, and then we'll bring this webinar to a close. Okay, um, I would just like to say thank you all so much. I love the engagement that was going on in the chat. Um, I love how you guys were communicating with me. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, what I just want you to remember as you go on from here, is for every organization start, the people are the center of your organization. It is the way you treat your employees, the way you manage and utilize them. That is how you can achieve your goals. So managing and utilizing your human resources is directly connected to the, to the um, profits or the achievement of your goals. So it is very, very important that, that you learn how to utilize your employees' strengths, their abilities, and also um, really help them grow so that you can achieve your organizational goals and objectives. Thank you very much, Madam Oloetoin, for this great inspirational presentation. And I know the scholars have enjoyed, as you can witness from the questions and the chats that have come in. If there's anything that one need to take home this day is um, a quote by that you have made there from Jim Collins, that great vision without great people is irrelevant. So while you take on this day, uh, I know, will move with this quote out of all the uh, all the con con content that has been shared in this. I know this sum sums it up, and because if you have an initiative, a vision that do not have 
great people, then eventually it won't stand. We want to thank you very much for giving in your time. And thank you very much, everyone who has uh, joined in. We are grateful that you, you, find, you found this time and you are able to join in this webinar. Have yourself a very splendid day, wherever you are.